there, and welcome to Coming Back, a podcast about coming back to life after loss. On today's show, we'll talk to Heather Kelly, who hosts the podcast Money Making Sense about being suddenly and unexpectedly terminated from her full-time job. Also on the show today, a listener called in with a response to episode 18, Why I Keep Doing This. She's got some thoughts on the pain of a breakup, and I'll speak frankly to the unfortunate reality of the grief comparison game. I'm Shelby Forsythia, an intuitive grief guide who speaks, writes, and teaches the transformational power of grief and loss. My mom's death in 2013 set me on the path to becoming a lifelong student of grief, and I use what I learned to equip others with the knowledge to heal and remind them that they are not alone. Because even through grief, we are growing. Let's get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much for being here with me. I've got just one last loving reminder that our second fun one episode, episode 20, is coming up next week on September 27th. We'll be talking all about grief's connection to Gary Chapman's book, The Five Love Languages. And the five love languages are receiving gifts, words of affirmation, physical touch, acts of service, and quality time. Normally, the five love languages are used and intended to help couples in romantic relationships understand each other better and communicate with each other better, but the five love languages can be seen in all relationships, so parent-child, best friend relationship, co-worker relationship, and even in grief. Did you go over to clean your friend's house after they'd had major surgery? You're probably an acts of service person. Did your grandmother handpick items from her home to give to everyone before she died? She's probably a gifts person. Did your best friend keep a gratitude journal during his breakup and fill it with kind words from people who love him? He's probably a words of affirmation person. So I want to know where have you seen healing from grief connected to one or more of the five love languages? Where have you seen people grieve because of a lack of or misunderstanding of one or more of the five love languages? Call or write in with your thoughts because we're airing the show next week. 312-725-3043 or shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. I would absolutely love to hear from you. Alrighty, so... Have you ever felt alone in your grief? Have you ever felt so incredibly isolated and solitary and dark and helpless in your pain? Yeah, of course you have. I have too. Part of the experience of grief is falling off the face of the earth for a little while, knowing without a shadow of a doubt that no one else has ever felt exactly this way and believing with everything in us that our lives are completely, totally, 100% destroyed by our loss. Yes, of course you've been there. Maybe if you're listening to this podcast, maybe you're there in this space right now. But have you ever fought to stay there? Have you ever fought to live in that darkness, to make a home in this space of not having, to cling on to the story of this totally ruined my life? You may be thinking, no, of course not. Why would I do something like that? Why would I consciously fight to keep feeling like crap? Why would I want to keep telling myself and telling others the story that I'm helpless and hopeless and out of possibilities? Who would do that? And I'll give you one answer today, grief growers. Me. Grief growers, this is what grief comparison looks like. This is how it energetically feels when we hold up our grief in comparison to what somebody else has lost or somebody else is feeling. This is the point that we're fighting for, that our pain and our loss are deeper and stronger and worse and harder and darker and more painful and more difficult than anybody else's, that our hearts are in worse shape, that our lives, our stories are more damaged than theirs. 
And you know what sucks about grief comparison is that it feels good. It feels good to be the victim. It feels good to be pitied. It feels good to win the my horse is deader than your horse argument. It feels good to be the more broken one. It feels good to continue to author the story that our lives are totally ruined forever by our losses. Why? A lot of reasons why. Because then we get the eyes and the ears on our story that we want or that we didn't have before. Because we put other people with quote unquote lesser losses in their place. Because finally, people acknowledge just how bad things are for us. But here's the truth I have for you this week, grief growers. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, or what language you speak, or how old you are, or what type of childhood you had, or what color your skin is, or what your education is like, (sighs) all griefs are felt at 100% for each person. Every single loss that we experience is felt at 100% max capacity for each of us. And our capacities may look different on the outside. Our losses may look very different. Our losses may look the same. We may label our griefs the same. Death, divorce, miscarriage, job loss, pet loss, child loss, loss of a home. But we cannot compare pain within losses. Because for everybody, the pain is at 100% of what they can feel. There's no contest in that. There can't be. So these arguments I've seen on Facebook about Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, where people are like, at least your family got out in time. At least your grandparents are still alive. At least you still have a home to go back to. And these real-life conversations where people reply with, oh, you think that's bad? My cousin lost her job and got diagnosed with cancer in the same year. Be glad that's not you. Or these unspoken family comparisons where you grieve openly for Uncle Brad when he dies, but nobody seems to care when the youngest child's pet lizard escapes for good, saying, but he's just a pet. Where are you making comparisons of types of grief? In your life, do you have an invisible scale that you line things up to? Do you follow the internationally known and published scale, the Holmes Ray scale, where death of a spouse is the absolute worst thing that can ever happen to you, and minor violations of the law are the least of the worst? Do you compare other people's lives to yours, compare their stories to yours in attempts to come out looking worse or better? Here's the truth again. Grief growers, all losses are felt at 100% capacity for every person. Yes, for some, the death of a spouse will be the absolute worst thing that's ever happened to them. For others, it will be the loss of a job or betrayal in the form of abuse from a parent. It might be moving to a new country and never being able to go home again. It might be the death of a child. It might be the destruction of a lifetime of dreams in the form of a diagnosis. We can't know. We can't know somebody's pain. We don't know somebody's pain until they tell us or show us, and even then we can't feel it for them. We cannot assume the emotional depths that someone has walked through based on the life experiences that they've had. We cannot assume the emotional depths that someone has walked through based on the life experiences that they've had. I'm getting chills this week, grief growers. We can't determine. We can't make that judgment whose life is worse, and whose life is better. So the next time somebody wants to try to compare griefs with you, here's what you can say. I hear that this was really hurtful and traumatic for you, but that doesn't erase my painful experience. Nobody experiences loss the same way. I'm tempted to say I'm worse off, but I don't know your story. Tell me more. What are you going through? I'm really going through something. It feels like you don't think it matters, but this is the hardest thing I've had to go through up until this point. I would love to have your support in this. It is so 
tempting, so tempting to want to be worse off than somebody else, grief growers. It really is. And believe me, I have given into this temptation before. I like to hold on to my pain because in some horrible way, I think it reminds people of how strong I am to be waking up every day. It reminds me of that too. I'm the only one in my immediate friend group to have lost a parent. I'm the only one in my close family that identifies as queer. These are my I'm worse off than you stories. And I tell them and I keep telling them sometimes because sometimes it's nice to have people feel sorry for me. I'll admit it. It's nice to be told how well I'm doing considering everything that I've been through. It's nice to be validated in my pain. But with this opening segment today and with my life in general, I am working on silencing that voice of comparison. Not because my pain doesn't matter, but because my pain isn't the only one. My pain isn't the only one. I want to go from, and I challenge all of you to go from, saying, my hurt is worse, you don't know what this is like, to saying, this is the biggest hurt I've ever felt. What's the biggest hurt you've ever felt? I want to know what this is like for both of us. All griefs are felt at 100% max capacity. There is no comparing the pain in our losses. So get yourself off Facebook and those little comment threads. Open your heart when people start telling you their lost stories. Don't compare it to something else that you've seen or heard or experienced for yourself. Start treating all losses like they matter in your family and your home. There is no comparing the pain in our losses. We could all spend a little bit less time in the darkness of our losses if we could see and remember that we aren't the only ones sitting down there. And that's the truth that I have for you this week. I will be live on Facebook tomorrow, September 21st, talking about comparison and grief. So I would absolutely love if you join me. You can find my Facebook page at Shelby Forsythia Intuitive Grief Guide. Next up, I'll share a listener comment about last week's episode, episode 18 called Why I Keep Doing This. Hi, Shelby. This is Anne in California. I just got done listening to your podcast where you mention about um, how the death of the loved one is um, is different than the death or the death of a relationship, the loss of a end of a relationship. And I turned your podcast on today because I uh, it's been a year since my partner decided to leave our relationship, and I was finding myself kind of caught in starting to get caught into some um, grief, grief and loss feelings, and thought I wanted to listen to your podcast and. Um, I just wanted to say that I love the work that you do. And I also that I, I agree that one of the things that's constantly painful and was very difficult for me in um, especially my first nine months of going through the grieving of my relationship was seeing the constant reminders of um, things that I thought that he and I were going to do together and that each one of those that I find a way to get past on my own um, has been extremely powerful. I'm actually at a point right now where um, I'm at midlife and I'm thinking that I may actually buy myself uh, a, a fancy right-hand ring uh, because I need to be at a, a place where I'm not expecting a partner to necessarily bring things into my life that I can provide everything for myself and that my partner will truly be extra. Anyway, that's all. I, I just love the work that you're doing and um, please keep making your podcast. And I am so excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for calling in. This was definitely a pleasant surprise to find in my uh, voicemail box. Um, Thank you for your thoughts on last week's episode, why I keep doing this, where the article that I referenced was called The Crucial Difference Between a Death and a Breakup. And it came off really poorly to a lot of people because they thought I was comparing the pain of the death of a loved one and a breakup. And what I was comparing in the article, because there was some comparing happening, is is the aftermath, the things that you experience that are painful for both situations. And I've wrote so many articles about how death of a loved one is is hard and painful and brutal and just agonizing. But 
the the pains that come after the death, quote unquote, or the ending of a romantic relationship can cause different kinds of pain and we continue to feel pain long after the fact. And society doesn't give that uh, a heck of a lot of credit. So I definitely wanted to bring some light there. It's so good to hear that somebody else has experienced this and grief growers, as you're listening, this is just a friendly reminder that you are not the only one experiencing the pain that you're experiencing. Again, like our first segment from the show, you're not the only one sitting down there in that darkness. Your experience is different. Your pain is different. Your grief and the situations that caused it or are surrounding it are totally different, but you are never alone sitting in this pain. Um, another thing I just wanted to pull out really quick from Anne's call is that grief has woken her up to a couple of truths about her life, one of which is that she doesn't need to wait for a partner to provide her with physical objects, or even uh, the promise of forever. That's something that she can promise herself through a symbolic piece of jewelry and and find a partner that fulfills her beyond that. Because when we start putting expectations on future partners, it's it's not necessarily fair. We create our own griefs for ourselves then if and when those promises get broken. So props to you, Anne, for for doing the work. It's been a year. Proud of you. You've been doing the work of coming back from your own loss in your own way. And it sounds like you're taking small pieces of your personal power back from that relationship. And all relationships define us and our identities in some way. So I'm really... Yeah, I'm just really proud of you. And thank you so much for calling in. I will continue to keep doing the work that I'm doing. And I would love to see and hear your voice if you're on Facebook uh, in the Grief Growers Garden, which is my private Facebook group. For anybody else that would like to call or write in, the number is 312-725-3043. I would love to have your voice in my inbox. Or you can always email if you don't feel like having your voice on the air, shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. Would absolutely love to hear from you. Next up, we'll chat with Heather Kelly about being forced out of a job she loved and how she came back more joyful than she expected. Heather Kelly hosts Money Making Sense, a podcast with practical advice on all things money. Her most recent episode called You've Been Hacked is all about the Equifax hack that occurred earlier this year and how you can protect yourself from identity theft. Heather is also a news and traffic reporter and occasional associate producer for KSL Radio in Salt Lake City, Utah. She is the proud mom to two beautiful fur babies. I'm so excited to have you on the show today. I want to start where we start all of our interviews and ask you to tell us your lost story. Well, this it relates to a job that I lost, and it started about nine months before I was actually laid off. Uh, uh, my manager, my direct manager, I showed up one day for work, and she wasn't there. There was a note that says, you're in charge till further notice. Uh, two weeks oh. a- after, yeah, literally, like, literally. <laughs> Oh like, okay. And we, she and I had become really good friends as well. She was somebody I really leaned on to, you know, just bounce ideas off of. So I felt like I was sort of mourning for her because to this day, it's been five and a half years, still have not heard from her. I've left messages, emailed her, like, are you okay? Nothing, not one word. So it was almost like, you know, she died and left my life. And then two weeks after she left and I was put in charge of the department, we went 24-7. We had been Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. And then we went 24-7. And I was all of a sudden thrust into hiring people, interviewing them, hiring them, getting them trained, and had been going doing that for about a month. And I got a phone call from my dad saying my mother was in the hospital and she may not make it. Oh, my God. So within a few weeks... I had like, you know, the some of the top five things that are the worst things that can happen to you all happen to me. And then nine months later, or seven, actually seven months by that point, seven months after I got the call that my mother almost died, uh, corporate execs walk in 9 a.m., just, all right, Denver is taking over your department and all of you are out of work effective now. They wouldn't let us walk back to our desks to get our personal property. We were escorted out of the building. They had somebody else go get our car keys and our purse and our jacket so that we could go home. And then they, like two weeks later, all of our personal items that had been in our drawers or desks or whatever were boxed up and mailed to us. So 
that was my loss. And it, it was even worse for me, I think, to see all the people that I had just spent six months interviewing and training and our department was running like a well-oiled machine l- lose their jobs. You know, they were counting on me for their livelihoods. And then, you know, they all lost their jobs. I lost mine. And it was just a complete devastation. This was a job I thought I was going to keep for at least 25 more years. I'd, I was going to retire from this job. And it was just, it was gone. And I kind of, I was so angry. I, I mean, I am a pacifist. I believe in gun control. And all I could think about was getting machine guns and gunning pe- the people down who did this to me. I mean, it was, I was, had gone kind of off the deep end. I started drinking excessively uh, just because I it, it, it hurt, like the feeling, the anger and the sadness and the disappointment was just so much I couldn't deal with it. So I just started drinking. And the times that I was sober, I remember going into the grocery store one time and I was just sort of aimlessly walking up and down the aisles. And I reached for a loaf of bread once and just started sobbing uncontrollably. And I had to leave the cart where it was and just walk out the door and sit in my car for 10, 15 minutes until I could control myself enough to drive. So it was, it was nuts. And after about four months, I finally realized, like, I came to the conscious decision that I wasn't actually going to move through all these stages of grief. And actually, after sobbing in the grocery store, I kind of figured out I think I was suffering from PTSD. Mm -hmm. from everything. And so that was about the time I drank for a couple more weeks after that. But then um, I finally went, you know what, it's not like it was a coping mechanism. And I probably needed it the first month. But it's been three more months. And maybe you should just stop drinking and deal with these emotions and get through it. And that's when I kind of when I stopped drinking, cried a lot more and yelled at a bunch of people. I didn't mean to yell at them, but it just, you know, (laughs) just yelled at them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, That's about the time that I started climbing out of that hole and coming back to the land of the living. I am trying to wrap my head around the picture you have just painted because it looks like total, I I don't know how to describe this, but it's like, I I said this in one of my videos in the past where like you, you take this fully grown tree and it's like when a bulldozer, like a crane or something just totally like uproots it and, and tosses it to the side. Yeah. Like all that stuff you've worked so hard to grow and the root systems and like so hard and the leaf and like all of this stuff. And it's been established for so long and you just get uprooted and just like tossed to the side. And you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do now? Like yeah. what, where is, so you describe for us like what happened, like the logistics of what happened, but it seems like this whole time in your life was a period of you having to act without answers. Did you ever get more answers as to what happened? Well, I was a traffic reporter and the company is nationwide and they decided at that time to just, to me, it seemed arbitrary. I'm sure, you know, book wise, they had their reasons, but they consolidated. They had probably 40 different um, markets that were reporting traffic and they decided to consolidate them into 25 markets. So 15 of us of the markets were just like, oh, Denver is going to report the traffic for Salt Lake City. Now, the reason Denver got it is because they were already reporting traffic not only for Denver, but for Seattle and Phoenix as well. Mm. So they're like, well, they're already reporting for three different markets. So we'll just add another market to them. So bye-bye, Salt Lake. There's, there's this total feeling of of being blindsided and even not being able to go back to your desk. There's like this element of not feeling human in this. No. Like really, you're just going to shuffle us out of here like a, like a cattle line. Totally. That is what it felt like. We were just, it was very unceremonious. In fact, they even said, okay, here's your uh, severance package. And if you don't agree to what's in it, then you don't get anything and you have no recourse. Like you couldn't even ob- object or or question what they might have put in that severance package. I mean, this might be a dumb question, but like, was this legal? Supposedly, I went to a lawyer, I had seven days, I had seven days to sign it. Oh my God. <laughs> so like, so no I, pressure. Yeah, no, not whatsoever. So I went to learn like, okay, is this legal? And they went through it and they go, well, yes, the way they've worded it and yada, 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 yes. 
And I'm like, okay. So your choices were no job and no severance package or no job and a severance package. So, of course, which one are you going to choose? Exactly. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my (laughs) gosh. This is just incredible. And wrapping my head around it is so, like... Yeah, I'm 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 sitting here speechless because I'm like we don't I'm like we don't treat people this way or we're not supposed to treat people this way. I I want to go into now like in the immediate aftermath of this. You talked a little bit about drinking and and screaming and being full of anger, but like where was your heart in all of this? I I literally shut down. I mean that's what the drinking was for was to shut down because. I've never experienced that intense of emotions in my entire life. And I thought I was going, I, I really thought I was going to either harm myself or someone else if I stayed in that state of anger and hurt and disappointment. And that's when I started drinking. And so when I started drinking, all my emotions kind of went away. And so I really detached from everything. So I, it's hard for me to describe my feelings while all this was happening, because all I can tell you is that pretty much for the most part, I was sloshed for about four months. Mm-hmm. Turned them off. Yeah. Um, where did that come from? Was that a societal thing or other former co-workers doing that or no it was me I was um all my my family does not live here in Salt Lake City and my best friend in the entire world I actually think of her as a sister she had just moved two years ago to Nevada so she was very far from me and my closest co-worker at that time was the the boss who had left seven months earlier that never I had never had contact with since and so I just like there was nobody there there was nothing there so I just started drinking although I was I will say I was very aware of my, I mean, I knew that I was drinking to escape. And one reason I knew that is because my father and his parents were both alcoholics. And I, I had, I saw that growing up and I, and I always told myself, if you need a drink, walk far away. And so up until this point, anytime I said, oh, I need a drink, I'd be like, oh, no, you don't. And I would walk away until this moment in my life. And I just drank. So were you afraid of yourself at all? Or afraid of like what might happen into the future? Like if it kept going? Yes. So uh, so my friend who lives in Nevada, I actually told her I said, okay, her name is Heather as well. <laughs> just oh, so that's you so funny. That's too funny. <laughs> I know. So you don't think I'm talking about myself in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I said, Heather, if I am still drinking six months after this date, you need to do an intervention for me. And so I gave her permission to save me, essentially, if I hadn't managed to save myself. So four months in, I probably would have still been drinking, actually, up to that six-month point if I hadn't had the complete breakdown in the grocery store and realized, okay, well, something's not working because you're drinking all these emotions away, and yet you go to reach for a loaf of bread and you just sob hysterically. Like, okay, that's not working for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny now to think about it, but but in that moment, it seems like, oh my gosh, this is everything. This is my... I want to know, because that seems like the bread in the grocery store seems like this pivotal moment of choosing to come back to consciousness and choosing to come back to, to your life and like really look at it. So, uh, so what was going through your head then? Like, was it something about the bread itself or you were just like, this is a routine in my everyday and I'm not happy. Or like you were just literally reaching for a loaf of bread and we don't know what happened. I was literally reaching for the loaf of bread and I started sobbing. Like I had no thought because I, I really, I can, all I can tell you about that trip to the grocery store is there wasn't very much in my cart. I, I'd been in the grocery store for at least 10 or 15 minutes and I maybe had four other items. Like I was just wandering, like I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I had to have food, but I didn't know what type of food I was supposed to get. I mean, this is how out of it I was Mm -hmm. just like, you know, I kept waiting for divine, you know, like, like, I kept waiting for the food to just jump into the cart itself, I think. Maybe if I stand here long enough. Right. And so then I get down, I'm like, oh, yeah, bread. And I reach for it and just start crying. I know what's going on in my life as far as my emotions go, for the most part, except for this four months in my life where I, all I can tell you is there was blankness and anger and despair and drinking. Where did that anger go? Like, where did you put it? (sighs) Oh, Um, I, I yelled a lot, unfortunately, with, even with my, my cats who were my babies before I got into broadcasting, I, I worked at a veterinary clinic. And so 
for me, animals are everything. I treat animals like like other people would treat their human children. And so it's never appropriate to yell at them. It's never appropriate to discipline them physically, as far as I'm concerned. And yet here I was for months and my cats were like, as soon as I walk in the door, they started hiding from me. Oh. Um, yeah, it wasn't good. That's kind of where the, the anger just sort of started spewing outwards when I stopped drinking. And that took a little while to keep under control. <laughs> and how did you do that? I had a lot of talks with not only myself, but my my friend Heather in Nevada, and I would, oh, let me tell you, having a friend that you have the, the most trust in, or a family member, it doesn't have to be, be a family member that you know, first of all, they know your deepest, darkest secrets, they're going to love you no matter what, is essential if you're going through any type of grieving process, I believe, that at least from my experience. And I would call her up and she would just let me cry or scream and tell her, you know, everybody's against me and how dare they and this, that and the other. And she just let me do it until I, not right at the very beginning of the process, but as time went on and then I'd say like things like, everybody hates me. I'm just going to go eat some worms or you know whatever it was. <laughs> that um, little song from a movie. I don't remember what movie yeah. it's from. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'll just go eat worms. Yes. And she would... She would call me on my BS when it mm. was a, when I needed it, and she could tell when I was just starting to do the self wallowing thing. There's it's one thing to be mad and 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 rightfully so, and be angry at the world. It's another to just start doing the self pity thing. And so she called me on it. She would she was like, uh uh-uh, uh, no. And so even though I didn't want to hear it and I was mad at her for a little bit for, you know, how dare you, Heather, tell me that I, you know, shouldn't be wallowing. Like, don't you know what I've gone through? And she's like, yes, I know. It's like, yes, I know what you've gone through, Heather. I've been listening to it for four months now. You know, <laughs> um, but she was a wonderful, wonderful help bringing me back to seeing what was reasonable for me to be upset about and what wasn't. Ooh, can you give us an example of that? So about six or seven months after I'd stopped drinking, uh, I was getting, I was starting to get a little bit better. I just, I had just gotten a, a job on call. I wasn't permanent employee at that point. I was just on call. And so basically that comp, the new company could just call me whenever they needed me sick or vacation or whatever. And after a couple of months, I felt like, well, I've been filling in. I do the job great. And how dare you not give me a permanent position? And it's all this other company's fault for firing me that I'm not permanent this other place. And Heather <laughs> stopped me right there. She says, Heather, really? It's your company that let you go. It's their fault that this other company won't give you a permanent position. Come on. Like, get over yourself. She's like, I'm going to hang up if you don't see reason right now. <laughs> and she did one time. No, I'm not sure it was that. that she hung up on you? She hung up on me. And so then I had to, like, after, you know, a few hours of stewing in my own juices and then figuring out, like, you have to think about it. You have to go back and go over the conversation. And hopefully most people can be enough self-aware that they can see that point in the conversation where they go, oh, yeah, that really probably wasn't fair or that's not right or now I've crossed the line or, you know, whatever it was. Sometimes when you're in the moment and you're just spewing off stuff, it you don't realize when that spewing starts crossing the line. And so for me, Heather was that, uh, okay, that's it, I'm done. And she would hang up. And then it was up to me to figure because she wouldn't call me back. She'd be like, when she's ready to calm down, and she's going to talk to me, she'll call me. And then I'd be like, okay, Heather. All right, I get it. Can we talk about this now so that you I can get your perspective on why this is happening to me? And it's tricky, because grief is not really rational. Grief, grief is not rational at no. all. Um, we can be upset about all kinds of things and especially projecting forward into the future in our lives. Like everything can be traced back to that one bad thing that happened. And if that one bad thing never happened, then our lives would not look this way. And that makes perfect logical sense in our brains. But when we try and apply it to new people, new situations, especially if they've never been exposed to our grief story before, right. uh, your friend Heather is kind of right in the sense that like, really, that's not 
they don't know your whole backstory and they're not the reason that they're not full time. Like, it's, right. that's interesting that she kind of was, she was kind of a voice of reason that kept you in check. But also, it seems like or it sounds like she was somebody that urged you to get a broader perspective on on your emotions and your grief at this process. Yeah, she did. I mean, the very beginning, the first few months, she was great about just, okay, I got to let her go. It was after I stopped drinking and then we, you know, start talking and if I was getting angry or yelling and if she felt I crossed the line, that's when she just, she, she was like, nope, not going there. Did you always Uh, trust her judgment in that? Yes, I did. I want to rewind actually a lot and go back to what you said you you ha- there was a blip in your first question about having PTSD and having that recognition come to you. Was that something that somebody else pointed out to you, like a therapist or a counselor, or even like a friend through observation? Or is that something you kind of stumbled upon for yourself? Because this de- this does seem like a traumatic experience. And of course, you would have PTSD after that makes perfect sense to me hearing this for the first time. Yeah, it's something I I stumbled on myself in the different jobs that I have had. I've come across some people with PTSD. Working at the veterinary clinic, we dealt with a lot of animals who were uh, companion animals, service animals to people who had PTSD. So we had, as a veterinary technician and as a manager of of a veterinary hospital, I had to go through a lot of training, understanding. Sometimes just bringing their pet in was a bit of a stressor for them because they were worried about their pet. Like, oh, what are you doing? Like, and if the animal, if the dog, it's usually, it was usually dogs. If the dog didn't like being, uh, having their blood drawn or something like that and maybe uh, yelped a little bit or something like that, that could cause stress in the person who had PTSD. So we went through a bit of training just in my different careers that I've had. And so all of a sudden it, I realized like, oh, I think that's what I have. (laughs) How did that present for you in day-to-day life? Like, would you have run-ins with new bosses and be like, oh, that's, I'm upset about something that's not this. Mm -hmm. I think it's PTSD. Or did it, you know, come through nightmares or, you know, interactions with yourself in your head? Like, how did that, how did that crop up for you? A little bit of everything, but I would say the two, two of the biggest ones were I, at my new job, was learning, I was trying to learn a concept that was a little bit difficult for me and I had four or five different people try to explain it to me and at different times and by the time the fourth person came what that fourth person said just sounded completely different than what the other three people said like they were talking about something I was like are we even talking about the same thing here the same project why are you this just seems brand new and I just started crying I I just started crying right then and there I felt inadequate I just had these it was this that feeling that I had right after I was let go of I'm I'm inadequate nobody would want me as an employee because there's the thing I'd never been written up we'd never there was no discussion about oh your numbers and the ratings are going down Heather we're gonna have to look at nothing it's like the executives walked in they're like you're gone and so you're left to go the, the, the initial part now I found out later about all the other departments that they also got rid of at the same time but before you you find that out, you've got this couple of weeks where your psyche is just going, oh my God, what did I do? Did I not hire the right people? Did I, were my numbers wrong? Did I, was, was I over, I charged too much money for payroll? Did I get too many full-timers on there? So we're paying too many benefits. Like what is going on? And so it just felt like I'm a bad employee. There's nothing I can, you know, no matter what I do, I'm going to get fired was basically what I was walking around feeling. So here I am, I'm not understanding a concept. I can't get it down. I've got a fourth person, you know, the fourth person trying to explain it to me. And they, it sounded to me like they were speaking a completely foreign language. And I just, I completely lost it because I felt like, oh my God, this is it. I like, I'm never going to get this and they're going to fire me. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because it's interesting after, like, when tragedy happens, a lot of times the first, if we can't find enough answers, we look to ourselves and people are like, oh, well, that's good. We must have some answers. And no, we just heap, heap blame and heap shame and heap the cause of everything onto ourselves and kind of take that on as our own. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it, and then it happened a second time at the work, not in front of the first time when that, <laughs> when the fourth employee was trying to explain it to me and I burst into tears, I was in front of everybody in there. And then there was another time about a month or so later, I went into the supervisor's office and we were discussing the schedule and I was trying to explain I cannot pay the mortgage just being an on-call person. And I understand that on-call is very up and down. It depends on who's going to take their vacation. And you, and I had, at that point, I had to hope people were sick so that I could come in. But I was like, I can't rely on that. I can't pay my mortgage not knowing how much money I'm going to make. So I've gotten us another job, a second job. But I'm hoping to work something out here where I'm, you know, telling her what my hours were going to be. And I just started crying again because I think in that moment I thought, okay, she's going to tell me that I'm no longer worthwhile as an on-call person because I'm not available at a certain amount of hours of the day because of this other job. So haven't these mindsets started to shift it all for you? Mm. They have. I have. This is the company that I now uh, work at permanently. I'm still part time. I don't have full time status there yet. But I, because I was on call when I started there, I'm not only a news reporter, I learned how to be a news reporter. I've learned how to be an associate producer. And of course, they use me as traffic reporter because that's what I was doing at my old job. And This also is the company that gave me the opportunity. They came to me and said, hey, how would you like to host a show? And that's when I started doing the Money Making Sense show. So they saw, even even though I burst into tears at a couple of times at the beginning of, you know, my not so illustrious career there, um, they told me that they trusted me and like what I'm doing by asking me to do a show. Because that's an investment. Yeah, exactly. So that has helped a lot, helping my uh, insecurities. Now, I I do find that they creep up from time to time. That's really weird because I didn't have those insecurities before I lost my job. Of course not. Of course I mean, not. I, I'd switched careers a couple of times, but it was on my terms and I knew what I wanted. I was kind of looking for the place where I wanted to be and I found broadcasting is it. Um, but then I lost that job with, with, at, with no notice whatsoever. And I still, it's been five and a half years and I still, every once in a while, feel like I'm looking over my shoulder going, oh my God, are they going to come in and fire me? Like, mm-hmm. it still happens once in a while. And that's like one of those lingering elements of grief that's like really irritating and really terrifying and just still just like, okay, who's going to die? Or like, when are they going to come in and fire me? Or do they want to break up with me? Like, it's all these things that like, oh my gosh, like there's still that slight feeling sometimes in the back of your head that's like, I see another shoe in the air. When's it going to drop? <laughs> and sometimes they're shoes that we create for our- ourselves and they're just like hanging out in the air and like nobody put them there except for us. But, yeah. you know, sometimes there's things that start to look eerily similar to the last time and you're like, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Um, so how do you make peace with that feeling of, of things being out of your control and things could be taken from you at any moment. How has that mindset or mentality changed for you since all of this has happened? Well, I've always believed, even before all this happened, that everything happens for a reason. But I never had to actually put that into practice until, <laughs> until I lost my job. I just walked around like, oh, everything happens for a reason. You know, it's one of those things that somebody tells you something bad happened to them and you go, oh, everything happens for a reason. And, yes, I, and, and I, people who like when bad things happen, people are like, this is such garbage. Why do you, how dare you say this to me right now? <laughs> it's the same thing you said to your friend Heather. It's like, do you even know what I've been through? Right. My goodness. Right. So uh, I always, but I did. I mean, I truly did believe that. I just didn't know it uh, by from experience until this. What I have discovered is, yeah, I was willing to retire from that other job. I would have stayed there for thirty years, been perfectly content being the manager of that department, doing my traffic reports, all of that, and I liked the job. It was perfectly fine. But what I've discovered being in the job I'm in now. I love 
my job. I am joyous. I wake up every morning. I I have to be to work at 4 a.m. And I wake up before my alarm goes off. I love every, I love the people I work with. I love the, the corporate concept that they, that they get. Now, they still haven't hired me full time. That's one of the things I'm not thrilled about, but, but the, how they treat their employees and, and the type of work they want from their employees. They're very, very adamant that we, as a news as a news company that we tell the facts we do not lean one way or the other anytime you're doing any type of a story it's this person said this but this person disagrees and this is why we can we never ever do a one-sided story this company i work for refuses to go down that road mm-hmm. and i love it that's quite refreshing yeah but it's really easy to see one side of your grief story of this job loss of being made a victim of being thrown out and experiencing this, this trauma that just totally blindsided you. So how have you, what has changed in your life and what has changed in your picture to allow you to incorporate the other side of the story? What is the other side of the story for you in this? Well, the other side is I have been able to grow. I've learned so many more skills and not just job skills. I have learned life coping skills because once I got rid of the alcohol and stopped drinking, I had to learn how to cope with my emotions. These are emotions that I'd never really been confronted with before. And so I think that will do me very well moving forward, especially, you know, some relationships aren't always rosy. You know, not just work relationships, but personal relationships. And now, if I'm very angry or sad or distraught or something, I, I know I have the strength to get through it and not by drinking. That's power, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that is total power. Could you do this again? Could you go through something like this again? Could I? Yes, I, I could. Do I ever want to? No. <laughs> Well, of of course. Yeah, that's never the question. But grief doesn't really care what we want (laughs) in terms of when it swoops into our lives. Yes. But yeah, that's a good answer to that is, is could I? Yes. Do I really want to? No, because at the end of the day, grief is, is this, it's not something we really willingly go into. No. I mean, I, I even, I hate to use the term, I'm glad I went through it because I'm not, I'm, I don't even know that glad is the appropriate term to put on all this that happened, maybe grateful. I think I'm very grateful that I went through this experience because if I hadn't, like I said, I, I, I would never know what true love and joy of life is, not just my job, but my life. Because, you know, I was, I was happy. I was fine. I was, you know, content. I was, that was it. I was a content person before this, but I don't know that I was ever happy and joyous. And now I am. That's awesome. That sounds like you're very uh, more aligned today than you felt in the past and needed this to know that. Yeah, I th- true. I want to know as we close up interview today, if people want to get in touch about your podcast, Money Matters, if they want to get in touch about losing a job and coming through the other side of that, uh, where can people find you and your work and what are you working on next? Oh, well, my the show is Money Making Sense. Uh, spelled just like it sounds. I'm on Facebook as Money Making Sense. There's Instagram, Twitter, but probably the best way to get a hold of me is the Facebook page, Money Making Sense. Uh, Facebook, it, you can type any questions that you have there, uh, private message me, and I will be happy to answer anything about grief or I take money down to a very individual level. How do How will tax new tax laws affect you if you make less than $30,000 a year or over $75,000 a year. Um, DIY, when is it more cost effective to do uh, some construction projects yourself? And when will it actually save you money to hire a contractor to do it? Uh, You know, all sorts of topics that we cover in money making sense. And it's on a personal level. Money, memories, death, divorce, you know, grief, all of it is all kind of tied together. So it sounds like your show is a phenomenal resource for anybody looking to um, deal with personal money issues. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. I hope people learn something from it. And same with your show. I think it's phenomenal that you are able to 
talk about this subject that a lot of people just don't want to talk about. We're brave in the hard subjects. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Heather, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Shelby. You have a wonderful week. So that's all for this episode of Coming Back. Thank you so much to Heather Kelly, who has an awesome radio voice, if I do say so myself. Heather came back by asking her friend, Heather, to hold her accountable for her drinking and by opening herself to the possibility that her victim story wasn't 100% true. You can find Heather's podcast called Money Making Sense on Facebook. Just search Money Making Sense. She's also on Twitter. You can also subscribe to her podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, Overcast, or kslnewsradio.com. Money Making Sense is a finalist in the People's Choice Podcast Award, so be sure to drop her a little congratulations if you reach out to her or follow Heather's work. This week is your last chance to call or write in with your thoughts on grief and the five love languages. The sooner, the better. 312-725-3043 or shelby at shelbyforsythia.com. Join me tomorrow, September 21st on Facebook Live at 1 o'clock Chicago time. We'll talk all about what to say when people start to compare griefs. Please subscribe and tell a friend about coming back because you never know what someone in your life is going through. A big heaping honking thank you to Mr. Addie Goldstein who composed our theme music. You can find me on Facebook at Shelby for Scythia, Intuitive Grief Guide, Instagram at Grief Guide Shelby for Scythia, or simply shelbyforsythia.com. If you'd like to leave a question or a comment for a future show, leave a voicemail or text 312-725-3043 or email me at shelby at shelbyforsythia.com subject line podcast. As always, my dear grief growers, it was beautiful sharing this space and time with you today. I see you. I am proud of you and the work that you're putting into the world. And I love you because even through grief, we are growing.